Welcome back to The Retrospective. In this episode, we're going to start with Kirsten Cairns and Matt Graff, and we'll be in Rune. Rune. Welcome, everybody. In today's segment, we're going to talk about Rune, the Rune subplot of season two as a whole. And to help me with that, I am joined by Maggie, as always, and our special guests, Kirsten Cairns from the One Ring.net, Green Dragon on the One Ring, Ring on One Ring.net, and Matt Graff from Nerd of the Rings. Um, so, so Rune. There's a lot of stuff we didn't have any time to talk about because we always run out of time with Rings and Realms. And with you guys, it's such an opportunity to dig into some of the things that we just want to explore a little bit more. So we've got a few points for Rune, um, but I feel like the big one that we should start with is the wizards. Who are these guys? We want to explore the ideas that have been introduced to us, where we think they might be going with it. So big picture. And again, this is, I, I know that there are, are people out there who think I'm just like being delusional, still talking about the blue wizards. But what I would emphasize, I've said it again, but I think it's worth saying once more, looking back on season two, that has been the characteristic of season two, right? If if the if the main plot line of the strangers plot line in particular was new wizard, right? Um, you know, the 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 narr the strangers narrative in season one is what if, you know, what is it like being incarnated for the first time, having a, you know, Tolkien talked about the different relationship that the Astari have with their incarnated bodies. It's not just like a Maiar taking physical form, right? And so they clearly really leaned into that to imagine, you know, those scenes like where the stranger's trying to learn how to eat and things like that, right? And, and of course, his memory only slowly coming back. That was the narrative, right, of season one. Season two, the narrative has been the Blue Wizards narrative. Um, you know, that is like, and I know this is not a, I'm not in denial. <laughs> I'm not. But, um, but that's, but that, that, that's been the narrative. Uh, the Gandalf stuff, which especially comes in towards the end, that's like the next layer that's being added onto it. But I think it's, I have been frustrated, and I talked about this in an earlier episode. I've been a little frustrated with the fact that a lot of the, a lot of the discourse about this is just focused on identity, right? Like, who is he really? And people who are like, he's Gan, you know, it's just distracting. He's Gandalf. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not that it doesn't matter, but it's not the whole story, right? When you look at the story of season two, this is the Blue Wizard story: the wizards who go into the east, and their job in the east, as it, which is vague in Tolkien and still has been vague so far in season two, as far as knowing what exactly role the stranger is supposed to play in opposing Sauron, you know, building his power in the East. But that's the job of the blue, blue wizards. Go into the East, help to attempt to prevent, to both protect the people in the East and prevent Sauron building his power base because the East is the traditional center of the power, like the power of Morgoth, uh, you know, in among humanity um, originally and always has been a traditional major part of Sauron's power. Um, and, and of course, in the, uh, you know, in Tolkien's, well, in the texts, in those fragments in which Tolkien talked about the Blue Wizards in various places, of course, we get the two different narratives about the Blue Wizards. The one, um, the earlier narrative in which he says they both go bad, right? You know, and uh, he says collectively they go bad um, and end up being the head of magic cults in the uh, in the East. And then in the later version um, uh, that he wrote about a decade later, more than a decade later, in which he speculated that, in fact, they at least in some measure succeeded and that it would have been much, much worse uh, had the Blue Wizards not been out uh, in the East. And of course, they seem to be doing both of those things. So what do we get? Lo and behold, we get a wizard going into the East to oppose Sauron and another one who's a, who has also gone out into the East and who has gone bad and is now leading magic cults, exactly, uh, exactly as Tolkien described. So almost 100% of what Tolkien said about blue wizards has now been depicted on screen. Um, there's much more to tell that is to actually 
develop a further narrative about what it looks like. What are the threats in the East? How can the building, you know, how is Sauron going to try to build his power in the East? Um, how can that, how is that going to be thwarted, you know, or opposed in some way by the stranger? I was going to say, let's throw that to yeah, you guys. Exactly. What are, what are some of the things that you is, think you've been seeing? Well, it's not unusual for the showrunners to do this, right? To Re take yes. um, uh, plot points that are from texts that they don't have the rights to, <laughs> yes. um, but use them in ways in that like, yes. use the kind of shape of them, as yes. it were. And so I think you're absolutely right that um, uh, so far as we know, that, you know, from what we can guess and work out, that they don't have any access to Blue Wizard plots officially. But that doesn't mean they can't be inspired by blue wizard plots and that does seem there's a lot of things throughout the season you've been like oh that's a really nice callback to this part from one of tolkien's jottings or that and so yeah i think that's what they um whether they always had the intention that at the end he would be revealed to be gandalf i do think that they had must have had the blue wizard plot in mind uh, when they're creating this this wandering in the east and this this other wizard that he encounters, um, who uh, it just now seems like it's probably going to turn out to be Saruman, and I I'm really I'm ah that's not my favorite. I, I but um, at first I was like no 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 that they won't do that, and now I'm just like oh I think that might be where we're going. Yeah, we should talk about that. <laughs> I, I don't know if we should talk about that now because okay. we we Let's have an end segment. We're gonna. We're Matt gonna yeah. has I know. thoughts. So I, I I think maybe you know we'll get somebody saying, "Boy, that dark wizard sure is a sour man." <laughs> oh God. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe I I will say I'll chime in a little bit with with Corey was saying with uh, you know the the fixation on the identity. Yeah. And. And I, I agree, I do think it would would be more effective to look at the story we're getting. Yes. But I would also note that, you know, the show itself is very concerned with his identity. You know, yes. throughout the yeah, yeah. two seasons. So so I don't Absolutely. think that's an unfounded focal point for conversation to circulate around because right. it's it's a, a well, big question the show poses and and keeps referring to. Yeah, well I'd make a distinction there though. I agree. Like obviously his identity and his finding his name is a plot point. But there's a difference between what matters is finding out which wizard he really is and saying his search for or his discovery of his identity and purpose is a major point in the plot, right? So and in, in fact, season 1, I would say yeah, yes, fi figuring out his purpose and what he is as a being. Season two, they really turned up the what's his name, right? Yeah. Really, yeah. Came and, into but play. but that's also like the next stage mm -hmm. of that same process, right? right. I mean, it, it's clear even in you know those last scenes in episode eight of season one, he has he knows much. I mean, even to like he knows the word Istar, right? Like he's you know he's able to you know he's able to process all that now, having made that past that one decision point, but he still doesn't there's still much that he doesn't know he doesn't know exactly what he's supposed to do he doesn't know um he he knows the direction he's supposed to go but and i, I like your distinction corey um the distinction in a way between us needing to know his name and yes. him needing to know yeah. his name that yeah. is a big so distinction. there's that in in a lot of magic there is the idea of the power of a name yes when you know the name of something that gives you power over it and and for your own claiming your own identity the naming of yourself is a very important thing. Um, and so uh, I, I, but I agree with you as well, Matt, that I think it's a big ask to have the audience to be like, okay, he is looking for his identity, but you need to just chill on that. You yes. Know? Um, yes. But I will say, if we are able to chill on that, uh, I do love a lot of the writing of the strangers scenes in season two. I, I found, I think Daniel Wayman is terrific. And I found his character just charming. Um, a lot of kind of 
delightful, uh, dare I say, Gandalfian whimsy. But yes. you know, this this kind of speaking in riddles a little bit and the good humor and and um, so there was a lot that I really enjoyed. Maybe not about the propelling of the plot, but of the just the little the moments, building the character the vignettes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I really enjoyed. Yeah, I really liked his naivety. You know, he's he was very sweet. He was very concerned for his friends, and he had that from the very beginning. But we started to see that form as part of his character, not just this like front. It was very much driving him through his process as well. You know, which one are you going to choose? The wizard staff, which is another thing we should talk about. Yes. Um, or saving your friends and having that end up being a test of his character. That really builds a core that I found compelling, taking him into the next part of his story. Name doesn't matter as well, much there. And, and that's that's how he discovers his name, right? It's, it's I mean, yes, like the Grand Elf thing, um, which I was going to say I don't love it, but like who does? But uh, the... I, I mean, thought it was rather cute. It's <laughs> cute. I, I agree with cute. Cute. Is, I, I oh, yeah. don't love cute right. in that instance, but it's 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 cute. Anyway, but but the point is, I, it's not it's not that. I, I mean, okay. The, what I dislike about the Grand Elf thing is that it gives the impression that like, oh, that's the origin of the name. That he's like, Grand Elf. That's very close. I'm gonna come up with a name that's similar. But not exactly the same as that. But also, they kept earlier in the season two talking about him looking for his gand. His gand, yes. So they'd already kind of done so the, the original origin, etymology is actually it, there. Yeah, so they had him looking for his gand, and then they suddenly turned it into Grand Elf, and I'm like, no, what? Yeah, but <laughs> to me, all of that stuff kind of masks the main thing. When he comes to Tom Bombadil at the end, and it's like, I passed the test, and I now I know my name. He knows his name in the same way that he knew the word Istar at the end of season one, right? Nobody told him, right? He didn't like figure that out. He, the mystics do call him an Istar, though, in the in the finale right, of season but, one, no, I think. Right. I, the scene that I'm thinking of is when he translates it. Like he oh, okay. he, he doesn't just know the syllables; he knows what it means, right? It means wizard. Gotcha. Right. Um, so he like he gets his having made the decision in season one helps him like clarifies his own sense of himself and his purpose. And it's the same thing when he comes to Tom Bombadil, he's not saying, Hey, what do you think of Gandalf? I'm trying that on. Right. Because they said something like that, but I, I I've tweaked it. Right. No, he's saying like, he, he, he knows he has a conviction. Like it's a, this it's is what my name is. Quite an echo of the uh, Gandalf. That was my name. That was right. Yes, yes exactly. Exactly. It's interesting they because he says in that moment he says that's what they're going it's to what call they're going me. to call me yeah yes like yes. future exactly wise. it's yeah. Yeah. that's why I said it, th this is not a I'm trying this out right this is my proposal of what my name would it be it was a real knowledge and again, that's why I don't like the Grand Elf thing because it you know it teases the audience but it masks the actual story yeah. that they right, seem to be right. telling which is of him again because as you say Matt. He has a quasi prophetic insight into what his name is going to be, right? And that that's the resolution of yeah, that whole plot, of the whole identity plot in season one or season two. He's unlocking an understanding of his yes. true self. Yes. And somebody else happening by chance to go Grand Elf diminishes yes. the strength of him unlocking yes. who his true self is. Yes. So it's like, Two great moments, the Gand and him being like, oh, yeah, interspersed with a little, like, what? Grand Elf? What? Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the part I don't like. I mean, the cutesy is not my favorite. It is. Yeah, I mean, but I feel like I need to defend my statement now. But, <laughs> no, I mean, no, it's true. It's really, true. I thought it was just a sweet solution and a cute moment to go, ah, but I absolutely see what you're saying of, like, but it doesn't work to serve It's kind of an unneeded we solution. Exactly, yes. right? Yeah. It's, yes, yeah. and... And it was very yeah. on the nose. So it's, I feel like it was very much for the people that hadn't quite figured it out yet to be like, hey, you know. Yeah. So there is a certain element of convenience there that can be annoying. Um, I do like seeing the uh, foundations of the immense affection between Gandalf and, and the halflings. Yeah. Can we talk about the halflings? Can we talk about the Harfoots and the stores a little bit? Because yes. I mean, we all have questions about what's their purpose. Um, but I am curious about what we've seen and where you think it might be going. 
Matt, you're not starting. Kirsten, would you like to know? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> I would be curious to hear your thoughts, Kirsten, of where yeah. you think we're going. But Matt, I very much want to hear your opinion as well. Not sure I swear. I <laughs> Perhaps I should be the light that comes <laughs> after the darkness. <laughs> oh, man. You've got a reputation. This is quite the build up. <laughs> yeah. I like this. Kirsten, your Kirsten. thoughts. Um, yeah. I d well, first of all, I think. As I keep saying on anything where I'm invited to talk, the acting in this show is terrific. And I love seeing Markella Kavanagh and Megan Richards being just absolutely charming as Nori and Poppy. Um, I really like their relationship, I like their friendship. Um, I thought the people playing the stores were great as well. I like less the way Poppy sort of suddenly has this relationship that seemed underwritten to me, whether it was, you know, ended up on the cutting room floor, but it seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, and I like the idea of how do the Harfords go from being seemingly entirely nomadic to becoming I at least in one of their strains, uh, people who build Hobbit holes. Right. Well, I mean, it worked the other way around, right? They started off with the stores and the Harfoots defected right, right. and but became... we have started like, yes, with right, the Harfoots, right. is what I mean yes, by right, that. Yes, right, right, right. It's for right. us as viewers, right? Well, we have started by seeing an entirely nomadic right, right. strain of race of, of halflings, and now we're seeing some who build villages. Right. And so that starts to, for us as viewers, to lead towards something. So I can sort of see Different what it's options. doing there. Yeah. The, um, yeah. The heading us towards the Shire. Right. Though going, so it's, I think for me, this is one of the things that worked best in this season with the Harfoots, because on the one hand, we're going backwards in time. Right. And that was the thing that I was getting the sense of in episodes one and two. It's like, okay, so they don't know what they're going to find in Rune. Um, but what they're discovering, they're going, they're not setting out to find out the history of the Harfoots. Um, but I, in episode two, I was saying like, I think, you know, they're going to be discovering their ancestry. They're going to be going backwards in time. Um, and so the fun thing to me, I think it's fun, is that when they go back, they find hole dwellers, right? So like basically, in their history is their future um and that we begin to, the way in which that kind of recontextualized on both sides future and past that like the harfoot the migratory life of the harfoots that's an intermediary stage right it's presented it's all they've ever known it's all nori and poppy have ever known it's the it's the harfoot normal that we've learned and, you know that we we're oriented to in season one and yet in the span of the history of, uh, you know, of Hobbit kind, um, it's not, it's not normal, right? In fact, it's a, it's, it's, it's kind of deviant and And it wasn't the original purpose. Yeah. You know, they didn't yeah. mean to wander forever. It's just, they hadn't found a place to settle and then kind of forgot that they were supposed to settle. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's, um, that's really my, my biggest disappointment, disappointment with the end of, um, the end of the season is that they set things up really well. I thought in exactly that way that like about purpose, right? Um, what is Nori's purpose? Nori has this like calling, right? Does she? She did. I'm struggling with in Nori. season one. She did in season one. That's she what did. I'm saying. Yes. Okay. That's 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 where that's I'm, where the problem comes in. Yeah. Right. She had this calling to go beyond. You know, fr from episode one of like wondering what lies beyond their wanderings. From one of the first trailers we ever saw. Exactly. Haven't you ever wondered? Yes. yes. Right? Yes, oh, that was exactly. So that's that's the cornerstone of her character. And that gets kind of channeled into the purpose of her relationship with the stranger, which she doesn't understand, but understands that it's an important purpose. And then the way that that dovetailed, the episode, was it what, episode four? four or five when she learns the story of Rory Burroughs, right? The, 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 the original Harfoot, right? Um, and so to combine her Nori's sense of like, I have a calling to something else, but I don't know what it is. And then to discover Rory Burroughs, the Harfoots, the origins of the Harfoots is in someone who had a vision and he knew what it is, but he didn't achieve it. Right. And I was like, oh, well, that's 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 lovely how that all goes together. And now we see. So at that point in the season, 
I was like, this is great. I love where this trajectory is going. I love how this story is all fitting together. But what? where is she at the end? You know, that's where I don't, I don't see it anymore. And, at the end, you know, both the, none of that got followed up. Um, even the question about how, what's she going to do in relationship to the stranger? Is she going to go turn herself in? Is she going to, um, that was presented like she had a major moral dilemma decision to make and she never even made it on screen anyway. But then at the end, when she's just like, it's high time we go our separate ways. And I'm like, really? For what? Yeah. Like, yeah. Where I mean, are you going? Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm like, that's I'm like high time. Like, yeah. this is new. Like, this is, you know, it's just not a, uh, any, yeah. Okay. I do want to hear what you, what you have to say about oh, okay. it. So, yeah. Any, any, any <laughs> thoughts here? Um, so, in relation to, in, in terms of Nori, I think basically what, what they're probably setting up is her to take over that you know yeah that role of being the one to lead yeah the sort of all the hobbits to the shire descendant yeah. of she's Rory she's gonna be Burroughs. the the hobbit moses basically right. and lead them to the promised land um i will say for the record <laughs> that uh megan's song the, this wandering day yeah was Wonderful. one of my yeah. favorite lovely. bits of season one by yes. the way it yes. is a lovely song and it that is. is a lovely montage and yeah. Daniel Wayman's acting as the stranger, uh, especially in season one where he's like nonverbal. Yes. Really great. Very powerful. Um, yeah. I did think, you know, as we got to the finale of season two and they part ways, the, you know, the filmmaking part of my brain did say, wow, that actually gives them an out to not have the <laughs> hard foots going right. forward. Like yes. it could be an ending to their story if, you know, and, and obviously I have my opinions, but if, if they find that, that, you know, that that storyline is not resonating with audiences and that that screen time could be used elsewhere, they actually did set it up to where they could feasibly cut it, you know, cut it and like have the hobbits cameo in yeah. season five where they find the Shire and, Right. Maybe like that's they're it. They're just lost for two seasons. Yeah. And then, oh, yeah. we find them again. Yep. Yep. It and would be epilogue yeah. moment. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It would be almost the equivalent of taking a turn in the script to accommodate like the loss of an actor. Like, you know, yeah. the, this yeah. actor's yeah. quitting the show, so we have to find a way to kill off his character. Kill him off right. And have you know, uh, so, I mean, it's it, it, it would be almost that kind of an effect. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. I, can, I can see, I don't think they'll do that by the way, because I think they feel you can't have Middle Earth without hobbits of some ilk. Yes, but which I don't see eye to eye with, uh, no, I must I admit. Totally, <laughs> I know, I, but, right. uh, but I think that's where sort of where this yes, is coming yeah, from. Yeah. But one of the, and I'm sure this will get talked about in other plotline discussions, um, one of the issues is so many plotlines. Yes. And so some many. great plotlines that we just don't, get enough of time with they, yep. they, they are disserviced by the sharing out and so um i'm not anti the half foot story at all but i wouldn't mind if they were like in season three we need much more time for numenor yes so the exactly. half are taking a break yep. and they'll come back rather than give us little bits well like just don't forget there are harvards over here you know they almost did that with the pilar gear Story. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Right. I totally. mean, we didn't get it until episode. Th we got it in episode three, and it's been yeah. very. We minimal. got it in episode four, and never again until the short segment in episode eight. Yeah, yeah. That's like flip, all we got of that. Flip the Harfoot and a Rondier, you know, uh, screen the time, right. and then I'm like, oh, okay, now we're talking. <laughs> Give me more Rondier, less Harfoots, so and I, we're good. I, you know, I, I think Nori. Um, again, I think she's great, and I, I don't like you. I don't see what her obvious plot line is going well, forward now and therefore maybe yeah maybe she does lead them to the shire eventually and maybe that can come back in a later season and i feel like just cheesily you can see poppy appearing with her now husband and a couple of kids running around and them just saying ah home you know right. well and setting I'm that back. exactly yeah, yeah setting yeah. that up do you think yes. all the kids will have like the crazy the crazy, crazy hair? 80s crazy. hair band hair i hope yeah. so yeah. uh with like acorns in Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Or like flowers growing out of it or something. But um yeah, so th this is my uh my my problem is exactly as you said, Kirsten. Um it's not 
the problem isn't just that it's not clear. Ex- I mean, we, you, we can see an ultimate ending, but it's not clear what the next steps are. Um, my objection is that we could see that. It's not. This is not a question of them not having a plan. This is a question, and this Matt is one of the reasons why I, I sort of incline to your to your reading of that. It feels like a pivot. It does. Yeah. Between episodes yeah. five and eight, feels yeah. like a pivot in the Harfoot plot because it's not that they had no purpose or like, that the storyline had no trajectory. It had a clear trajectory, and in episode eight, that element, not the stranger plot line, but the Harfoot plot line has lost its trajectory. And that parting between the two of them, I found extremely disappointing because it does not follow up on all of the cute, like we're given all these cute, we're given all these directions. And it's not just a lack of payoff is like the reverse of payoff, right? We're, we're kind of unloading. I think that, unloading. Was, that was my struggle with it, that we had foundations laid for an additional relationship between them that would carry forward. So it just felt a bit unearned when that pivot happened, that it was a pace change. If it had a few more scenes where we see a natural divide forming, but we didn't see a natural divide forming, we just had a crevasse. And I do wonder if there are things that were victims of the cutting room floor, because there there were quite a lot of things in this season, in, in all the plot lines, where it was like, wait a minute, why, this person's yeah. here now? Or, yeah. the, the, you know, and I... And I it's I, trying to do a lot. Yeah, that's the, the thing. There are so many plot yeah. lines in a you know relatively short amount of time for as many stories as they're telling. And I wonder if there are various stories where we're kind of getting whiplash, but in fact, it did move more progressively, but they're like, right, we've got to cut that. And, we're, you know, so who knows? Who knows? Um, but I, I, hope, I hope the Harfords and the Stores are not gone forever. You know, I, I can't imagine, I mean, just in a production way, there's no way we would just end it forever. I imagine we'll see them before five, but I'm sure they'll circle around to that just to keep it. But it seems that, the dis- I mean, I w- I'll be interested to see James's data. Yeah. I, he hasn't finished the data collection. For episode eight, it's not done. For, yeah, I mean, just like the, t- the, the total screen time yeah. question. Um, but I mean, certainly the the qualitative experience of the show is, you know, season two compared to season one is, wow, that was much less. Yeah, and what I found really interesting was the the word count that they have. So Hoppy has the has more words than the stranger. And I just find what they get to do with that really interesting. And I was doing a comparison of about that level of words and Farazan has more, Disa has more. There were so many that were higher than the stranger. But what he gets to do, and I think that's down to performance more than anything else, um, with those really built the character for me. Yeah, he's not as wholly nonverbal as he was in season one. Yeah. Right. But he's still not talkative <laughs> yeah. either. But he's yeah. so expressive. Yes. Yeah. So much yes. more comes across. Yes. He does a lot with nonverbals. A lot. <laughs> Daniel does. You know, yeah. There's a lot of that. It's part of what you're saying about the wonderful performances yeah. in this show. There's yeah. a, a great deal. I mean, I think of how much uh, Tristan Gravel does non-verbally sitting yeah. there with, with his that, eyebrows yes. with his eyebrows and like w- that really incredible evil smile that he does with that yeah. amazing beard right <laughs> he's, just, he's just up there on his little uh on his, on, on his little couch and we're right? not we're not Roman in Numenor right now but I, uh, that yeah. is what the one that i wish we had a few more words from him yeah here, yeah. But yeah. yeah we'll get so there. bringing it back to rune bringing there's, it back to rune. there's yeah. the the elephant in the room that we haven't spoken about i really want to talk about tom, tom I, I didn't really get to do any analysis of tom during during the, the season so it's something i was hoping to be able to chat with about you guys so tom did we love him did we not yeah, I, I, favorite I, bits? I i'm kind of in the love love yeah. camp here which is not to say that i don't have any issues uh i was very excited when i knew that we were going to see tom bombadil mm-hmm. i was like mm-hmm. finally tom bombadil on screen um i think rory kinnear is a terrific actor i love what he does uh, I do wish his clothing was a little brighter, but it is blue, it is yellow. I understand why they didn't want to go cartoonishly bright. I think they could have dialed it up a notch or two, but... Um, In terms of character, what what do you think he's serving? You know, how is how is he working with the story that we have? So, I, I mean... I was going to stay with Kirsten for a oh, second. Oh, sorry, Kirsten, right. of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I like, I like his, his um, voice of wisdom. I think it's a good way to use him. Uh, I I know people are like, what is he doing in the East? I get that. I don't have as much of an issue. I feel like Tom goes wherever he wants to go and does what he wants to do. I think it was a little odd that Goldbury seemed to be there, but maybe he was just on his phone outside 
finishing up a call with Goldbury because I was like, I don't think she'd be there. But I, so I, I, for me, I'm okay with, I'm not troubled by him being there. And I like the device uh, that the stranger needs someone to help him complete this reawakening of his identity, this understanding of his goal and his mission. And if you're looking for a character who can be an ancient wisdom, who better than the mysterious Tom Bombadil? So I like the role he plays. I'm sure you guys are going to talk about some of the words he says. Don't always like the words he says, but I like how he's positioned as a role. Um, I like his kind of nonchalance, uh, his sort of removal from the world around him, his not getting too involved. I love how he doesn't ever actually answer the question. It's yeah. just a bit, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's old Tom just kind of does his own thing and I'm not going to help you with any, I'm not going to help you with the ring quest. I'm not going to, might rescue you from old man Willow, but you know. Right. And so I feel like in many ways, they, they for me, they captured the essence of Tom well. And I like the basic purpose that he serves. And I love his song. Right. And certainly the other thing that was really conspicuous to me that I was just thinking of, of exactly what you said about, uh, you know, when you said what better person than Tom Bombadil, not only, you know, the ancient wisdom and pr perspective that he gives, but given that this one of the stranger's main storylines, as we talked about, is his identity. He's trying to answer the question, who are you? And who better to have that discussion with than the person who gets asked that? I mean, the issue of, you know, when Tom in the book says, who are you alone yourself and nameless, which he says in the show. And but when he says it in the show, it means something completely different because he is talking to someone who is alone himself and nameless at the time. But the point is. I mean, that was, I think, one of the best, um, one of the book quotes I loved most, especially in that episode, which was so chock full of book quotes. Um, episode four, brought to you by the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, <laughs> but uh, but anyway, it was he, Tom Bombadil, in the book, more than any other character in the book, more than any other moment in the story. The focus is on, like, the thing that keeps coming up is who are you? What are you? How do you relate to the world around you? Whether it's Tom being asked and deflecting the answer to the question, deflecting back upon them, the hobbits, Frodo in particular, the question of who are you? Or whether it's him helping through his stories, helping them to understand the lives of badgers and the perspective of trees, right? Um, all of those things. Those those things that Tom is associated with, those things that happen in the house of Tom Bombadil in the book, fit perfectly with the stranger's storyline yeah. in and this season. What you were saying at the beginning of this this chat about maybe uh, maybe as viewers we should be less obsessed with who the stranger is and more kind of what his personality, his role, his yeah. function it's, is. It's the whole narrative. If yeah. there's any character to encourage people to say, stop worrying about who he who is. Who I am. <laughs> yes. It's Tom Bombadil because <laughs> even Tolkien himself is like, I don't know. Yeah. And yeah. I'm okay with not knowing. Right. So right. He, he's, it's a, again, a good character to put in that position. Yeah. Matt, thoughts on the topic? I know, I'm like... I love how we circled to me laughing. Well, really I just want to make like sure you're heard. And it's, it, I'm just going to say, guys, it can be hard like, to get a word in edgewise. So no. I'll make sure that you well, get heard. Well, um, sometimes yeah. we conspire to let some people not get a word right. in edgewise. Right, it's true. When we I'm dread the best. words was, they're going to say. I was, for some reason, I was told I had to be on this one or else I couldn't be on the Celebrimbor one. So <laughs> I'm just doing my duty here so I can talk about Celebrimbor later today. Um, <laughs> no, for, for Tom, I think I, I would have loved to see his jolliness dialed up mm -hmm. by like 50%. It's it's like the colors. They were yeah. a little more, it was a little right. more muted yeah. than it might have and been. The, like the colors, you know, that didn't didn't bother me a whole no, lot. Right, I, right, I did right. a Tom Bombadil cosplay at Comic-Con a couple it years was, ago. I, I saw your recent Tom Bombadil. Oh, yes, yeah. Yes, in New York. <laughs> yes. yes. I'll have to Google that. <laughs> Matt showed up on the red carpet in New York in a bright blue suit with yes. bright yellow shoes. Nice. It was, it was yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Looking very deaf. Okay. Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. But from the from the cosplay experience, I, I know that like dyeing 
material yellow is very hard. Yes. So it's, it's hard fair. to get a bright blue. Right, so, especially so without, that, without yeah. synthetic dyes. Right, yeah. 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 So I, I didn't mind that so much. I, I just think, you know, he, like, I really wanted him to sing his his songs and not kind of, like, murmur his songs a bit. You know, that to me, like, dialed it down a little too much. Um, I actually, like, one of my, my, I will say, my favorite element of the whole Rune storyline is the self-contained moment where Gandalf and Tom sing together in At Tom's house. Yes. I think that is yes. absolutely Love lovely. That. Like that as, as you know, setting aside anything I, I feel about Harfoots or, you know, who Gan the fact that the stranger turned out to be Gandalf, that moment is yeah. delightful yeah. because, because of the whole two years that he spends later after, you know, everything's gone down in middle earth, <laughs> so to speak. Um, was was absolutely great. Yes. Um, I did love that moment. I I do think he serves kind of the purpose of you know he's he's kind of like Middle Earth Yoda a little yep. bit. Yep. Um, in yep. in this season, actually, maybe too much. Maybe, maybe. too much. There's, maybe. A, there's a heavy emphasis too on Yoda-like. the training side yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. teach me your yeah. tricks. A big kind of Star Wars feel yeah. to a lot of I, this. I I would have much preferred it to be you know le- less like. Okay, I'm gonna train you up. I'm gonna test you, and more, more just irreverent conversation. And for Tom to kind of, you know, maybe minimize or like make fun of, you yeah. know, his his missing identity thing, and just be like, well, well, of course you should do you should do this. Why are you why are you freaking right. out about this guy? So to some extent, they did that in that like the stranger kept being like, show me how to control my power and Tom yeah. kept deflecting as you said he yeah. never answered a, a question directly right yeah. he um so to some extent they did that i mean it seems he seemed to- a little more mad that like when he's like yeah what does the secret fire need with you as a master yeah. it's like it's like whoa hey, yeah. okay we're yeah. gonna oh i didn't know i couldn't serious. ask that yeah. 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 yeah 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 um yeah no, i i i i quite like that framing of it but yeah, yeah. though though it's um i mean there are moments where he gets serious yeah right um, like, you know, when he says the line, of course, which they gave him also in the show, you know, about like, you know, the, the, each of the, you know, the, the, the beasts and the trees belong each to themselves, mm-hmm. you know, like yeah. that, that would indeed be a burden. Right. Yeah. Um, so there are moments in the book when he gets serious. Yeah. yeah. When like the hobbits ask, like, bumble into a question, which he's like, whoa, whoa right, hang on yeah. that guys. <laughs> right. You know? Um, so it's not that there's no element of that, but I, but I agree. It was, it was, it was. It seems to me that what what they seem to be kind of balancing, right? The different and the differences in this way, the way in which it's a little more, um, he's a little more training. For, he's a little more um, purpose driven, right, in his relationship with the stranger than we might, as you say, like. Wouldn't it have just been more fun to have him meet Tom Bombadil and be like, I'm going to sing and feed you food and tell you stories and yeah. bye. Yeah. No indication of why you were here or what this achieves. I would have right? loved that. Right. That been exactly. Fantastic. It, it would have been more fun in a lot of ways and in many ways truer to the book. But you can see they were, I mean, as is, I mean, how many times do we say this in this show? They're trying to do both things. Mm-hmm. Right? right. They're trying to both satisfy the fan and well, create you know, ca- driven story. Stay true in a sense to like the character and depiction of Tom Bombadil, while also at least gently resisting the I, I really appreciated um of all of the um of all of the commentary that like jd and patrick like things that were they were quoted as saying in articles and things like that um the one of the smartest things i heard them say smart in the sense of like you know i heard it and i'm like that's a really good interpretation of the text uh is when jd was talking about tom bombadil and was was talking about how tom bombadil is this almost anti-dramatic character like he he's he's a character that resists like the you know that, uh, He's not on a plot, right? Like story you know, the whole like, like he doesn't there is a arc. conflict <laughs> moving towards the resolution None of the of conflict. Like Tom Bombadil is like the ha uh-huh, nope, the yeah. anti particle to that entire thing. And it, you know, so when JD was saying like that's that's exactly correct about Tom's role in the story. And of course, JD was talking about it in the context of the challenges of, in, you know, uh, saying why he's so unsurprised that almost nobody has ever attempted to do Tom Bombadil because in a screen adaptation, it's really hard to bring viewers, keep viewers engaged with a whole sequence of the story, which is like, and now you are in fairy and weird things are happening and now we're leaving fairy and everyone's like 
That was strange. Moving back to the plot right. now. Right? I mean, there are already people who have a hard time with those chapters in Tolkien, you know. Um, but anyway, so trying, seeing how they're on the one hand pushing him in the, like, you know, giving him a function. He has a he has a role and, in the and story. And they did find a, a good role as, yeah. as a result. Yeah. They found a good that, role for That him. plays directly on, because they found the way in which his own, the themes, the Tom Bombadil themes of identity and, uh, and, and, and the nature of things and understanding, um, you know, the, like the, the relationship between him and the, and the, animals in the trees and what it means to be master. All of those things dovetailed perfectly with the stranger's plot. And yet they still tried to make him bombadillish. Yeah. I, I, it's funny as you were talking about, you know, how unforgiving an audience can be when you have this, okay, now here's, here's our little side quest. Right. Of, right. That's going to be totally bonkers. I actually think TV is the more forgiving medium yeah, for definitely. that. But I, I do think, they would have had to limit it to a single episode. Right, like a bottle if they episode. Were, yeah, yeah, they would have yeah. had to have either a bottle episode or like one portion of one episode, the stranger meets Tom Bombadil, and it's super weird. Yeah, Weird, and then, random, yeah. and then you move on. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And yeah. it would be that would, one that would, would probably have a cult following. And people oh, yeah. Remember that one? There would be people yeah. who right. watch that one over and in over fact, and over again. they could have just made it a musical episode because <laughs> yeah. that would have been perfect. Could have, uh, yeah. Once right. more with feelings. I was just going to say, I'll go back to Buffy. Can I? I was just going to say though the I like Tom Bombadil's role. I don't like, and you just brought it up, how much it started to feel like it was Yoda and Luke. Like it felt like, and and one of my issues with the Rune plot in general, I've said all the things that I've enjoyed and loved, is how much I felt like we were in Tatooine. There's a shot where you see the stranger and Nori from the distance, and it looks like three PO and R two wandering through Tatooine. Um, the Easterlings following them. I mean, they probably look like Death Eaters. Their armor kind of looks Star Wars. Yeah, yeah there's kind of strange masks. Tusken raider -y type thing. Um, yeah, so, and then to have the plot become this, you're getting a false message that your friends are in danger, and if you leave now to try and rescue them, you won't complete your training. And I'm like, w did we just lift this from Dagobah? So uh, that was... Odd to I would me. agree with that, and we have talked about the aesthetics of of this world. It, I think it'd be really difficult to have two characters on a sand dune from afar and not think about Star Wars. It's so pervasive in our like it's, community culture. It's true, and I think once you start to notice it, you know, we were talking about this with JD and Patrick yesterday. That once you start to notice it, it's everywhere. Yeah, sorry, I just put that out there for everyone. <laughs> if you hadn't already noticed it, right? But I mean, what I'm saying there is like I do think there's a lot, but once you start looking for it, it's going to be very easy well, to I, make. Those. I found myself wondering, um, rewatching the beginning of the season, uh, it, it's the east. They want it to have be kind of a desert realm. It's going to feel different from anything we've seen in Middle Earth before in any it version. Is different. Right. Yeah. yeah. And for me, it just didn't feel like Middle Earth. And I was like, is that on me because it's just so different? Or is there a way that it could have, and I'm only talking about my taste, successfully been both this new and different desert? And still felt more like it belonged to Middle Earth. I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's really, I, it's really interesting to wonder like what that would look like. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do think you know one of the things that Rune, uh, the storyline suffers from is that we get so little characters aside from the the stores. You know, we get the the masked men, and one of the points that I was most interested in the storyline was when he said, "Our people used to be kings." Yeah, and I was like. Oh, really? I'm curious about that story. And yes. then that guy dies. And I'm right. like, I right. guess we're not getting his story. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, yes. but, but, and, we and, only and the earlier bit about like the curse that's been laid on yes. them yeah. and yeah. everything. I'm like, okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's like, I'm, I'm way more interested in the people and the dark wizard yes. and what happened there yes. than, than with the, the, especially Harfoot because stuff. it's a new topic. You know, yeah. if it's yeah. completely new, then that's in the realm of the adaptation and the creation. Yes. But it's based on something that kind of makes sense. So tell yeah. me more. Yes. And we also have the fact that, that. <laughs> the Harfoots have a wandering song that relates to that land. Mm -hmm. Like, that's interesting. How mm -hmm. come part of their history, I mean, you know, we've talked about, you've yeah. addressed the history, but w did they come from further east originally and wander through that land or whatever? But So there's all this kind of hints at the history and the peoples and the 
of this realm. And do you think that that was foundation lane for this world? And we're going to learn more about those guys coming on. I mean, obviously, we're going to have more know. of the evil wizard. He's I, he's clearly would, a big yeah. bad that we I would guess, aren't yeah. really threatened by yet. Dark wizard. <laughs> Actually, right. he doesn't like. He doesn't that like is dark wizard. The name wizard. I do not True. embrace. Yes. I, I, that's why I call him the dark blue wizard. Uh, <laughs> but um, the navy wizard. The navy, the navy wizard. wizard. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I don't call him that for fear of offending the armed forces but still but anyway yeah he's he's the he's 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 the dark blue wizard um i i will say another thing on the you know the feeling that you touched on of you know does this not feel middle earth i think i think if rune itself was more built out because yes. we really only see storville tom's shack and then the, the temple dark from wizards. afar yeah. yeah from afar and yeah. then we go into an interior shot we don't get any sense of civilization right. like yes. there's where, no town where are the where are yeah. the easterlings you know yes. where are the, yes. where there are, are the people yeah. hordes of them apparently like the <laughs> massive armies of sauron drawn right. from yes. the east yeah. so there have to be like somewhere some, somewhere a city yes. or something yes, yes exactly yeah. but we have not found it yeah show me rune city where's <laughs> rune city <laughs> exactly. yeah right and also, even we could maybe have seen some ruins, ruins yeah. of rune. Yeah. You know, at the end of season two, where uh, Galadriel and and Anatar, Halbrand, everyone else that she faces in that battle, have their showdown. They're in this kind of mini stone head yes. with all these Celtic yeah. 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 dishworks yeah. on it. Some ancient ruins, designation people. Surely, in rune, we could have seen some, some ancient. really cool uh, or runic dwarves. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, yeah. I, we're probably gonna get some other kindreds of the dwarves. I hope. In yeah. The, I mean, yeah. we got the brief shot right in the yeah. little summit meeting, and they they name dropped the Blue Mountains, so yeah. we know that yeah. some of those yeah. two clans are still hanging out over there. Exactly. So yeah, I would I would hope we get think, some yeah, runic we're, we're dwarves. I doubt they would be like, yeah, let's introduce dwarves into the rune plot also. Like, right. it's, there's enough. I was like, there's we have we, yeah, we a lot but, to cover. Uh, but, 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 yeah, but I do think... I, I know mean, where we could pull that screen time from, though. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying you, wanna, you want to remove that one plot so as to add a completely new, different plot in um, rune to take away from maybe. new Maybe. Well, no. <laughs> now that now you say it like that, no. If you're going to make these choices. <laughs> That's, these are the choices, right? But, um... I so on the one hand, I mean, I wasn't bothered. I was a little bit disappointed because I was hoping we would get more about mm -hmm. the curse on the people. Yeah. And I'm like, to some extent, I felt like the the mask was like Chekhov's gun. Yeah, it I was, had to I was, come I was, off. I was at some point. I'm like, yeah. surely before the end of the season, yeah. that mask is coming off, and it never comes off. Never yeah. Come off. So uh, yeah, so th there were in those kinds of ways. I felt this. I felt like we were set up for something that we didn't receive by the mm -hmm. end. I'm not kind of worried long term. Like I don't think all of Rune is in fact as desolate as the parts of it yeah. they've been in. You know, there are people. That, I hope there, there totally yeah. are yeah, people. Yeah, like, be. I, I believe that seems to be part of the premise, but. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it would be, it'd be a weird undermining of the Blue Wizard plot, wouldn't it? If you like, yeah. you must go into the East where nobody lives in order yes. to to make sure that Sauron does not recruit any of yeah. the eight people yes. who live <laughs> out just, there because it would be horrible if that happened. You're going right. on a vision quest, basically. <laughs> yeah, just exactly. Go. That's, that would be strange. I do think you're touching on a pacing element, though, that there are certain storylines that we've had a lot more time to develop and a lot of yes. understanding of what their drive is. And I don't necessarily feel like we have that with Rune as clearly yet. And and I think we've talked about this a lot. It's a big ask on the audience to just keep watching because it might, it might come to fruition in season three, four, five. Sure, I understand you've got a big arc going and we're just seeing the initiation, but there was a pacing thing for me with the end of this that I'm not sure what's driving them into season three. Where was right. the others? It's quite clear yeah. where we're going. Yeah, right. and I've, I've kind of made the point from an editing perspective. Yeah. You know, I look at throughout season one and two how as an editor, you, you know, I could take out the rune storyline and it affects none of the other storylines right for which sure. i think yeah. which i think it's you know it's it's part of the reason why you know i sit i sit up in my seat when oregion comes on and then it's like oh rune it's like well it doesn't make a difference Toy to these break. other ones yeah yeah <laughs> right Aww. well yeah i didn't go that far but <laughs> man but it is and it is it has been wholly independent so, yeah, so far. Yeah. There's been in, no um, overlap. It's the only one that doesn't touch on any yes, other. Yeah. In the UK, problem. there used to be a situation where 
uh, when shows were all just shown on TV during regular hours and you had commercials, the national grid in the UK had to be prepared for the fact that when there was a show that was really, really popular and everyone was watching, when the commercial break happened, there would be this surge of power because everyone went and put the kettle on yep. to make a cup of tea. <laughs> so if there were a way of knowing in which bits of the rings of power are there surges of kettles being put on, <laughs> that would right. be an interesting Metaphorically, yardstick. Of course. Right, yep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, B- but okay. no, I, mean, I just, going back to Maggie, what you were saying about pacing, right? Um, I think it's one of the, another one of the ways in which they're kind of like trying to do it both ways. Um, perhaps what we were taking, the problem with the plot being so brief that spending, but based on my subjective experience, which I think is different from Matt's, so few minutes in the Rune plot um, that what seemed to me like clear buildups to what we're going to see by the end of the season may well simply have been we're setting up for name, but if you have a small amount of time and you have to both accomplish a plot arc in this season and also lay the foundations for what's coming in the next season, right? Which, if I'm going to presume that Dark Wizard and the Gaudrim and the and the Stranger interacting with that society and thing, and that that's going to be a major element in season three and possibly four. Um, then we need to set that up, right? Yeah, we need to vital. have been prepared for that. But again, if if all you have is, you know, I'm just choosing an arbitrary number. If all you have is like 20 minutes and it's going to take you f- three minutes to set up the things that are coming in the next season, well, you've just spent 15% of your entire plot arc on set up for next season. So th- some of the choices there and the pacing choices felt odd because of the way in totally. which Totally. And, and those are all curtailed. real decisions that everybody has to make in the yeah. storylines, but they're very important decisions. Yeah. So, cause otherwise we're running the risk of getting into season three and having some sort of story developing there. And we don't remember who these guys are or what's at stake. So right now there's not this like clear and present threat of what's happening next for us to carry through for the next two years. And it's it's not like, oh, it's so therefore it's terrible. It's like, no, this one just didn't feel quite as ready to jump into the next season as some of the others. I wonder if, if part of it is in the rune plot, we have some of the absolute treasures of Tolkiendom, right? We have... Gandalf, as it turns out. We have another wizard who might end up being Saruman. Well, let's come back to that in a second. We have yeah. Tom Bombadil. We have halflings. You know, these are some of the, especially if, if people are like movie fans only, these are some of the absolute treasures, not Tom Bombadil for movie fans only, but anyway, uh, of Middle Earth. And yet this plot, as you've just said, doesn't have anything to do really at the moment with the rest of the plots. And so on the one hand, you sort of think, why would you shortchange these great treasures of, of Tolkien? And on the other hand, it's like, so are they only there because they're treasures of Tolkien. And it's like, okay, the plot that we're actually telling in Rings of Power is these strands, but we're going to add this as well because we want to be able to include. So uh, maybe that's what it suffers from. From one perspective, though, it's like, it, look at it from another direction. To say, okay, in this show, what we're doing is we're telling the story of the Second Age and we're filling in the stories, like we're filling in the blanks of all of these great, tales of the second age that are outlined but never fully written by Tolkien, right? Well, one of those things is the the blue wizards, like the blue wizards are kind of on that list, right? Especially again from the perspective of his later considerations of including the blue wizards in the War of Eregion time frame. Um, but even without that, uh, it would, you know, both what was the story of the blue wizards and what happens out east you know what did the blue wizards go to do like what what how does sauron recruit the easterlings what's what's that relationship like and how would a a blue wizard go about trying to do something about that um it is i mean i would include that on my list of like really tantalizing and interesting gaps to fill in you know in the story so it's not that i think the whole eastward facing element of the show for that reason from that perspective doesn't feel to me shoehorned in um but it is separate and and it's hard for people when everybody that i've talked to are like i don't see how it's going to come together 
yeah. with the others. Um, it doesn't mean it won't. It just, but, but it makes it harder for people to engage in because right. I don't see how it's going to connect. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, at some point, we almost have to see Sauron trying to recruit Easterlings or something. Definitely. You know, to tie those together, you know, just yeah. send Charlie Vickers out there to the right, desert right. too, you know. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I, I, I've got to think that that loops in at some point. I think, you know, to, to Kirsten's point, um, you know, we, we've get Tom Bombadil thrown in here and then, you know, we get the wizard as Gandalf. I think that's where the, the shoehorning feeling comes mm -hmm. from more mm -hmm. so than like the inclusion of the East, oh, totally. right? you know, I right. think it's, yeah. I think it's the elements that they've, put in they just Fantastic. all happen to fall in the storyline you're right that the east is a great storyline to include and it maybe hasn't been as effectively yeah. included and utilized as it could have been yeah well and it's i see maggie looking at us i'm like no i'm, I'm mostly going to wrap us up so oh, that, that's okay. where well, i'm, I'm, I'm gotta, the timekeeper of this we, game we've got to talk about but we have to, we talk have to talk about, about the sour man i know so we have yeah. to talk sour about the sour dark yeah. Yeah. blue wizard so let's have that be our final point and yeah. thoughts about what that role is and where we're looking uh, can i just say real quick tom is one and done right we think tom really Bob, I you think, think i think so. i would i, I mean i will I, oh. i'll be surprised if we never ever see him again i expect there to be like a cameo or something at the or end at the end yeah exactly yeah. in yeah. the grand finale when everyone or like sings together. maybe even like especially uh, maybe we might even see him in the withy window i don't he know just yeah comes out good you know now that's what i'm thinking <laughs> like yeah we see you know him and goldberry we get, we get the harfoot cameo where they find the shire yeah, exactly you know, because that's all they are now right, right. it's a cameo waving um, at tom bombadil as they go then, by but know? then you know but then the grand elf he he goes visits tom bombadil and they catch up and they start singing again and have a cozy little moment in the background. Yes. <laughs> Bringing us back to the Dark Blue Wizard. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Although this sounds fantastic. <laughs> okay. Keeping us yeah. on track. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, all right. I. It. Okay. Speechless. He's winding up. What? Here we go. Yeah. Oh, no. God. It's. I, Sar from here, Saruman makes no sense mm -mm. at all. Let's just state explicitly the problem. Explicitly the problem is you can't introduce a conflict between Gandalf and Saruman now uh -huh. and unless there 100%. is like a, uh, you know, unless we're going to see Gandalf receive a hard reset where his memories of everything he ha that happens Again. in the show is wiped total explicitly. Recall. I can't imagine him climbing into another meteor after the first experience, though. <laughs> I mean, like... Did he learn nothing? Yeah. There's right. got to be well, no, PTSD I mean, that's there. That's why he comes by boat the second time. Yes. He's like, I want no part of that. Again. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll no, take the I'll local I'll take the long things. way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The Express is horrible. Uh, <laughs> do not recommend. Um, one star. Uh, but the... Uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, so, yes, we... Clearly, we can't just spoil no the yeah. betrayal of Saruman. Yeah. you know later on. Um, and is is it conceivable that they could do that and then have what both of them receive have a, a memory, memory reset? reset? Yeah. you know, and then they come and then so we're supposed to understand that we in which, but that doesn't even make but, sense because surely someone like Elrond or Galadriel might remember, but, you know, that that happened. our audience has not had a memory reset. Yes. So, right. you know, yeah. it's, it would be a that. very strange thing. I got the impression at episode, the beginning of episode eight that they were trying very hard to make out that actually he wasn't the villain. He says himself that he doesn't like being called the Dark Wizard. Who would? Um, right. And obviously, I know he then does like bring rocks down on them. So there's that. Right. But, but I will now kill you all to teach you a right. lesson. Yes. It was a very yes. strange moment at the beginning of episode eight because I actually thought the way it was in that like blue twilight and he's walking around and chatting like old friend. And I was like, wait, how are they suddenly chatting together? And I thought it was a vision. I was like, oh, maybe oh. he's not really there. Maybe it's a vision. And I was like, oh, no, I guess he was really there. But it felt to me like they were going to suddenly go... We set him up to seem like a really bad guy, but actually he was just trying to connect with his old friend, his fellow wandering Maiar, and and to say, hey, we got to team up together against Sauron. Um, and so I thought, okay, maybe they're going to try and, like I say, bringing the rocks down undermined that massively. But 
maybe they're going to try and make it. That actually, he, we only pretended he was a bad guy. He only seemed like he was a bad guy from some people's perspectives. And once Gandalf gets to know him, he's going to realize that, oh, yeah, actually, we are on the same side. And so I, I had a feeling that cause, because I don't like this and I don't buy it, but I have a feeling that he is going to be Saruman. And you can't erase the memory. So How? the only way you yeah. can have it How? be is that he wasn't a dark wizard. He just, Saruman has always been someone who is less cozy and friendly mm -hmm. than Gandalf and more mission focused, maybe. And so his zeal and drive to f battle Sauron caused him to seem antagonistic. It's hard. I mean, oh, I know. <laughs> he, yeah. So he's just a jerk, is your. <laughs> Kind okay. of. Right. Yeah. And then the evil Gandalf's so like, much oh, as yeah. Yeah. I, oh, I don't unpleasant. Love, I don't love <laughs> your MO. You don't want to hang out with after work. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. like, right. I don't love your MO, but we share the same motivation. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that felt but like what the they were Saruman trying to But that's the Saruman thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's, yeah. What, that's, yeah. that's what the betrayal looks like. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and the stranger rejects him and how he operates. Yeah. Even Poppy and, sees through. And the even the dialogue between them is very from the books, Saruman and Gandalf, when Saruman yes. makes the pitch like, hey, it's the we could take That's over. The model. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Like there's no ring to talk about there, but right. you know, Gandalf makes the point right. in the books, like only one hand yeah. can wield the, the ring. That was the line that couldn't be delivered. Right. It was like yeah, the scene because there's without no ring. that line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, that was, um, yeah, yeah. No, I agree, but I mean, so this is where, this is where, so on the one hand, I'm cautious because I can't say it couldn't possibly be Saruman because, you know... Because we kind of said that about, about Gandalf, Gandalf, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. right. But, I mean, though I will say the difficulties or objections to him being Gandalf are n of a totally different kind than the objections to the Dark Wizard being Saruman. Like... Uh, I think a lot of the issues are his interactions with Gandalf. Yeah, right? what yeah, you've just well, been saying. Yeah, yeah. If we had a dark wizard as a sort of standalone character off doing his own thing, uh, and we we're like, oh, that's going to turn out to be Saruman, that would be easier to overcome Saruman than it, yeah. him interacting yeah. with Gandalf at this stage and then turning out to be Saruman. Saruman is the only dark wizard we know. So any wizard, I mean, it's Tolkien did suggest that other wizards turned to evil. Any wizard that turns to evil is going to look like Saruman because he's the only one we ever see do it, you know, in the story. So like the, the mere fact that there are parallels, the mere fact that that conversation echoes the conversation between Gandalf and Saruman um, doesn't to me like prove that he right. is yeah. or must be Saruman. Yeah. That's the clear model. Again, I won't go so far as to say it's impossible because... The, they, make, the they make they make odd decisions, yeah. Yeah. but again, but it's of a different nature. What they haven't done is like they have never yet impinged on an element of the Lord of the Rings plot. Mm. Like no choice that they have made has altered, like proactively altered the Lord of the Rings plot. Yeah, um, there are things that they've done like. Let's pull the fall of Khazad Doom into the second age. Right. Yeah. Right. So they they've borrowed from the third age. Right. They've you know so they'll do things like that. But to actually say we're going to we're going to I mean the Lord of the Rings has itself remained inviolate in a sense. Um, none of the choice, choices they've made have impinged yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, so like you know characters that have, when we talk about the character like like a Sildur, you know the 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 worst cliffhanger like nobody Fake out death. nobody yeah. thought Isildur <laughs> was dead no. right because he's got super plot armor right but where does he get his plot armor from the Lord of the Rings yeah, yeah. right yeah. and so we know what must happen with Isildur we know yeah. what must happen with Elendil even Gilgalad yeah. yeah because it's in the Lord of the Rings and there, I I can't yeah, think of a single example role, where they've yeah as an actor you're like ka-ching. Ka -ching. <laughs> I was five seasons for me baby okay not right. killing yeah. me off <laughs> exactly exactly but so that's what so to me that's what's at stake with Saruman yeah like and the only way they can possibly make it work is to do something really strange like a memory reset yeah, of both like a Men in Black right memory. yeah right. a flashy thing flashy yeah. thing yeah you know, exactly I, I just I feel like well first of all 
but I was sure it wouldn't turn out to be Gandalf. I was like, I was, surely yeah. not, surely not. Most surely of us surely. were. Yeah. yeah. Right? right. And so I've been going, no, not Saruman, surely right. not, surely not. But now it's Gandalf. I'm like, oh, I, shit. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's honestly. Why, that's why I can't, yeah. like, I, have to, I have to put an asterisk next yeah, to it. I, yeah, I think him being Gandalf, for me, rules out the other wizard being Saruman. You'd think. Like, I actually, I yeah. actually thought, you know, I had, I was obviously on Team Blue Wizard for, yeah. you know, yeah. until proven absolutely <laughs> false. I, I actually, like, my backup was Saruman because okay. I was, I was like, actually, it, it would be, be kind of interesting yeah. and fun to yeah. see him as a hero yes. because yeah. we don't get that in the films because yes. by that time he's already, he's already gone. He's already turned. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But I think making the stranger Gandalf kind of rules out like you said, you know, it totally undermines and it's hard. It shoots it would be really the, the later turn. <laughs> it's going to be simpler than you guys are thinking. Like, I have a feeling it is going to be Sarah Man. I have a feeling we're not going to love it. But I, I, I have always felt that there was always some tension in the Lord of the Rings between Gandalf and Sarah Man, even before the betrayal. Oh, so yeah, it's, it's, absolutely. Know, they call each other old friend, but, yeah. you know. They're Saruman's movie. jealous yeah. of him. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. not great chums, right? And no. I, I have a feeling it may just be that. They're like, yeah, well, they were never great friends anyway, and you can see how their relationship didn't start off yeah. that well. All right, I am going to wrap us up here because every minute we keep talking about Rune is a minute away from Celebrimbor. So <laughs> okay, I'm going to... Yeah? Yeah, yeah okay. I'm good. <laughs> see you guys. So... <laughs> So this was phenomenal. Hope you guys enjoyed very much. Uh, I've obviously, there's so many more things that we can discuss, but it was so nice to be able to dig into some of the things we didn't get to talk about. So thank you both for your thoughts on this, and we look forward to the next episode. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we're back again for another Q&A session with Kirsten Cairns, Green Dragon from TheOneRing.net. Um, and our first question here is from Alan W. And Alan was asking about lying. He was noticing, of course, the pattern that Anatar doesn't lie and was wondering, can the Maiar and Valar lie? Like, is that even possible? Um, so thinking about the status of lying, especially among sort of spiritual beings there uh, in Middle-earth, it certainly is fascinating that Anatar doesn't lie. Yeah, it's very interesting. And it's something that I, I found myself going back and rewatching and uh, trying to see if I can catch a moment where he actually outright lies. Obviously, right. he deceives. Yes. Yes. But uh, I started watching it and I'm like, that's true. Well, that's true. That's also true. You know, yes. he is the master of uh, spinning a web of deceit out of truth, yes. which, of course, is a stronger net yes. to catch people in absolutely than one built on falsehood i was particularly struck by the moment um when he when he unveils his big illusion mm. right and so when you know, this moment in which in one sense he's being maximally untruthful you know that he is he is immersed Celebrimbor within a lie yeah right when he steps outside and that's the moment when he comes to him and tells him an almost startlingly true version. You know, when he's like, yeah, I'm not actually an emissary of the Valar, mm, mm. right? Uh, I just, I, I came because I wanted to make rings of power. And I was just like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that is, I mean, the, 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 the way that he even stages that I'm coming clean and telling you, a, like a really true thing <laughs> right, about right. myself. That and was that's remarkable. Really interesting because, yes. Can they lie? He does lie in creating that. Yes. His, you know, yes. closed loop CCTV. Yes. Yeah. That is a lie. He has yes. created a visual lie. Right. To, uh, y you know, to deceive Celebrimbor. He's as to made Celebrimbor's whole on. world a lie, right? Right. Yeah. So definitely he can create a lie. Yes. But when he speaks, but I don't think it's that he can't. Yes. I think it's that he is cleverer than that it's more dangerous uh manipulation it's quicksand it's because mm -hmm. you don't know where the solid ground is because he's not lying but you don't know how he's using that right against you right right um yeah you know what i also um what i also wonder he's as you say merely to tell a falsehood is weaker Right. Mm -hmm. But more than that, I'm, I, I've been really struck by, for me, one of the big effects of the final scene 
with Celebrimbor and Anatar in episode eight mm. is I've been rethinking Celebrimbor's insight in episode seven when he talks about Sauron being the great deceiver because he can even deceive, deceive himself. Deceive himself, yeah. And right away it was clear that Celebrimbor was right on several levels, but there were some in which I was like, well, but not all of it. Like, he doesn't actually believe everything he says. He knows he's, you know, playing Celebrimbor. Yeah. Um, but the more, as the conversation in episode eight went on, I began to become more and more convinced that actually he may actually believe almost everything that he says. Yeah. And not that he's not aware that he's deceiving. I'm not saying that he's doing it accidentally or anything like that, but that is, I wonder, I suspect, that is, that the reason he chooses to tell the truth, he's setting out to deceive mm -hmm. and he knows he's mm -hmm. deceiving, but the reason he does that through truth is that he believes in himself. Like, oh, yeah. he's not just to deceive, to, to lie, right? Is just to, to, to claim that something that, it, that is not is, right? To create a fantasy world, which he will do, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Visually, right? But he is not a part of that, mm. right? He himself is not going to... Anyway, I, I'm not saying it well. But no, I get, I get what you're saying. I, I, think, I think that's that interesting. It's part of his own. It, I think it's a symptom, in part, yeah. of his own conviction about himself, that yeah. he feels like he doesn't have to lie. Well, and I think also, um, in the very beginning of this season, when we have the flashback scene to the dawn of the Second Age, yes. and you have Sauron. Yeah. In a fair yeah. form, then, but not Anatar. He's yeah. uh, Jack Loden, Loudon, however you say it at that point. Yes. And you see, then, I think one of his um, weaknesses, maybe it's his Achilles heel, I don't know, but that he really needs to be loved. Yes. Right? Uh, by which I mean worshipped. Yes. He really wants to be yes. worshipped. He wants high status. Yes. It is not enough for him to just wipe people out. He's not nihilistic. He can't he just wants win. To have, exactly. Yeah. He wants people to adore him for winning. Yes. And so I think that possibly he needs to believe in himself. Yes. Exactly. And if he is just lying this, lying that, then, it, you know, he needs to believe, no, but my own integrity of yes. my own making. So even when he's a complete visual lie of appearing as Halbrand, for example, mm -hmm. but maybe to him that's not a lie. Because right. maybe to him that's just another face that I wear. I am known by many names. Yes, which is his begins to sound almost like a compulsive answer to that question. Yeah. Like yeah, it was yeah, yeah. it was really creepy when he said it to Galadriel the first time. It was haunting a haunting callback when he said it to Kel Brimbor. Then when the orcs come in and say, yeah, Are you yeah, Sauron? Yeah, yeah. And he's like and he's still in tears and he's like, you know, and he says the same thing, it begins to sound almost automatic. Like he doesn't even know how to answer the yeah. question any other way. Well in this question of sort of deception and trickery as well, you get a very interesting um kind of game between him and Adar right. in in the beginning of this season, um, where he is you, when Adar has him as a captive at the beginning of season two, so Halbrand is there, he's captured, um, he cleverly swears allegiance to the Lord of Mordor, <laughs> yes. right? Great yes. moment. Yes. But you, there are lots of little clues and very well acted by both of these guys. And Sam Hazeldean gives us lots of little moments where he sort of, you see him look, you see it, and, and you know that he's suspicious of who this guy is. Yeah. And... Halbrand says something about the power over flesh. And he's like, wait a minute, that was what Sauron said at the beginning of the Second second Age. And so he has all these clues that this guy might be Sauron. And I was talking to Sam Hazeldean about the character, and he said, you know, the one thing that he'd had to really think about in the script was, why did I let him go? Right. If I have my suspicions, why do I let him go? And he said, in the end, I thought it was a kind of one-upmanship. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like... 
I know that you might be manipulating me, but if I know that you're manipulating me, then I can maybe use that to manipulate you. And so there's this sort of layering of of, of trickery. And, right. you know, if I make you swear to me and seem to let you go, but actually I'm going to follow you, then maybe... It, and of course, he's the great deceiver. Nobody out deceives the great deceiver. Yes. Um, but I like the idea that there's this sort of layering of trickery with each person trying to get one up on the other. Yeah, and you can see, I think, that same kind of idea reflected in the end of episode uh, six, was it? Yeah, the end of episode six, when Galadriel is saying, this is, you're doing just what he wants. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, Galadriel's been saying all season long, but she's finally correct, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, in fact, Sauron's plan, yeah, that Adar yeah, yeah, would bring yeah. together the orcs, and then, you know, he's gathered Sauron yeah. an army. Um, and Adar does it anyway, because he's going to one-up him, right? Like, yes, I know that you yes. want me to bring in... But because I know that you yes. want it... I'm going to be able to beat you. Um, I'm not walking into a trap with my eyes shut. I'm walking right. to it, my eyes open. It's not going to help, but... Right. But because I believe that I can beat you. Yeah. Even though you yeah. know I'm yeah, coming. Yeah, even yeah. though I know you know this is... You know, yeah. <laughs> if the... I know that you know that I know that... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I, yeah. going back to the, the question right. that was asked, I don't think... I don't feel at all that it's that they can't lie. I agree. Um, the Valar seem to be higher level beings who choose not to. Yes. Um, you know, they don't descend to the level of the Greek gods where right. they're tricking and deceiving and raping and pillaging. Yes. Um, but I'm sure they, they could if they wanted to. Well, I mean, certainly Sauron and Morgoth suggest that they can go down a different path, right, if they right, chose. Right, right. So that, that, that they have free will and seems to be clear. the Istari definitely speak in riddles. Yep. They definitely choose not to reveal things. For sure. And they choose uh, to play with how they reveal yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. There are moments. So I'm in the middle of writing uh, a chapter of... My, I'm writing a book on the Fellowship of the Ring, and... I'm in the middle of writing a chapter on, like in chapter two in, in, in uh, Shadow of the Past. Gandalf appears to say things that are not true. Mm, mm. And that it seems like he would know when he said them are not true. Right. What's going on there? Yeah. Right. And yeah. so it's a, it's, it's, it's a complicated situation. In the end, spoilers, I, I don't think Gandalf is trying to deceive Frodo. Yeah. I certainly don't think he's attempting to deceive him. I don't even think that he's exactly lying to him. Mm. Um, he is choosing to present information in a particular way for a particular right. reason. Right. Um, but as you say, like they'll do things like that. Yeah. But I, one of the most important things, in many ways, I think the the question about what do they have the ability to lie mm. is a question that is an understandable question. Mm -hmm. Because lying is a really big deal. Yep. Right. I yeah. mean, it's this is one of the things. There are a number of things. This is one of those things where I feel that our modern society and values make mm -hmm. some things in the Lord of the Rings really hard because there, there are some places where it's just our value systems. And I don't even mean like really big picture. This might sound perhaps to some like a big picture thing, but lying is not a big deal in our society. Mm. It's just not. I mean, it's hard for people, and this is something teaching medieval literature I come across a lot. Mm. Like it's it's hard to get a modern college student to really imaginatively um, put themselves, mm -hmm. imagine themselves in a society mm -hmm. where accusing someone of lying to them is like an insult yeah, that yeah, yeah, demands yeah, yeah, a yeah. duel. Yeah. Right? A duel yeah. to the yeah, death. Yeah, because your honor... Yes. And your respectability and your decency. Yeah. And I mean, we might, if somebody said you're lying or you lied to me, we might be a little offended. We mm -hmm. might be a little hurt, but we wouldn't be like, you know, only one of us can, can walk out of here alive. Yeah, you know, right, yeah. like that's, yeah. it's just, it's not that kind of a deal to us, you know? Yeah. So and it's, but in, in, and I'm not saying, obviously people aren't fighting duels all the time uh, in the Lord of the Rings, but truthfulness and telling the truth is like, uh, you know, think of, you know, Faramir and, you know, not snaring even an orc with a falsehood, you know yeah. I mean? Like that's yeah. that, that kind yeah. of, um, yeah. 
I mean, decency or, you know, but the importance of the truth, integrity, truthfulness. Yeah, integrity. it's it's very, very important. And I think also, um, you know, there are some characters and we see it in Rings of Power. There are some characters who are better at deception than others. Yes. So we see right at the beginning of season two that Galadriel doesn't want to. She would up. really like to lie. To yeah, Kyoko, she really doesn't to want Kyoko, to own yeah. up. That, yeah. Oh, God, it was Sauron. The guy I've been seeking for centuries. Yeah, it was him. Yeah, she doesn't want to own up yeah. to that. But she, her, and it's very well acted. My, and she keeps her like delivery twitching the, eyebrows. Oh yeah, she's got every her delivery tell. of that. Like it is, it's it. Um, it was Sauron, and she swallows the word yeah. and everything. That's one of my favorite deli line so there de are deliveries in the season. Um, high elves, you know, high up characters, high status characters who are worse at deception than others because yes. it goes against their nature. But I think also going back to your thing about lying. Um, Lying, just being like, oh, did you eat two cookies? No, I only had one. Right. In that way, a sort of simple untruth right. is very um, low stakes. Mm -hmm. It's small. It's kind of petty. And I think, so in a way, I'm, I'm agreeing 100% with what you say about right. if you are right. accused of lying, it's a big thing. And at the same time, when Tolkien is crafting these stories of great magnitude and they're, they're, it's mythology. There yes. are high stakes. Lying is such a sort of petty, mm -hmm. uh, it's a mean-spirited small behavior. Mm -hmm. So Smeagol, when he's Gollum, mean-spirited small behavior, yes. Mm -hmm. But for a character like Sauron, or even for a wizard who wants to control things a little bit, but a little small lie like that is just, it's sort of beneath them. Mm -hmm. It's a petty behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think Tolkien is creating situations and characters that are bigger than that. Yeah. So that goes in again to what you're saying in a way, although I'm, I seem to be saying lying is less significant, but I'm sort of agreeing with what you're saying, that it's a world picture where the stakes are high. Yeah, and this doesn't come up that often yeah. for that reason. I yeah. agree. Um, one, one example, of the, this came up in discussion in my Exploring the Lord of the Rings uh, class on Tuesday nights. Um, when we got to the scene in the, in the Council of Elrond where Boromir says that the dream came to his brother and once to me. Mm. And there were a couple of people who were like, I'm not sure I believe Boromir here. And mm. I'm like, wait, what do you mean? Like, you think he's just flat lying to the, to the, to the council mm. and mm. saying that he had the dream when he didn't have the dream? Why? Like, yeah, I mean, like, uh, and that was where I was like, do you realize what a big deal that is? Yeah. Like, do you yeah. realize how upset Boromir would be? Yeah. Like, you have to have solid grounds yeah. for that kind of an yeah, accusation. Yeah, you're going down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and, and just like, it's, because it doesn't come up a lot, mm. right? Mm. Um, the only time, the character who brings up lying the most too is Gollum. Yeah. He lied on yeah, us, right? Yeah, because he's got, yeah. he knows he how knows. to be two-sided. Exactly, you know? yeah, yeah. But that's interesting as well, because Tolkien wouldn't do that to us with Boromir. Right. Right. You know, there are certain characters who are, uh, we understand from the get-go, we can trust this character. Yes. And and if an author then pulls the wall out, pulls, you know, pulls right. the rug out from under your feet, that is a very specific device that an author might do to yes. do a big, I mean, a George R. R. Martin type, yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> he was, but right. that Tolkien doesn't function like that. And yeah. um, we know and we see it also in Rings of Power on the screen, yes. which is why occasionally it trips up in the script because there are characters that we believe we're walking alongside them. We have empathy with them. We understand them. We trust them. They are our every man, our way in, mm -hmm. our every elf, mm -hmm. our way into the story. Right. If the camera then asks us to, or doesn't let us know what they're doing, that's pulls us out of the situation because right. this is not a character who's supposed to be hiding things from us. Right. They might hide things from someone else, yes. but we have to be in the know about that. And yes. so um, if you can suddenly say, oh, well, I think this isn't true about a character where Tolkien has not that set that up. Yes. Now you can't trust anything. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There's it's. Yeah. In that sort of a case, it would, it really would be mm. a big deal. Um, and yeah, not only a big deal that is 
a significant assumption or you know accusation that you would be making about Boromir, but it calls into question a whole lot. Yeah, I think it, of the way in which Tolkien builds in the idea that Bilbo's original story wasn't true. Mm. Like that's a big deal. You know, Gandalf, some of Gandalf's earliest, really his earliest suspicions about the ring. He's like, yeah. that ring might be evil because it made Bilbo lie. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's yeah. weird, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? That is not like Bilbo. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So can they lie? These high, high characters, so the Valar, yeah. or the Maiar, or the very highest elves, probably they can, but I kind of feel like it's outside of their frame of reference. Yes. And they don't need to do it because if they want to deceive someone, they have a whole other slew of weapons right. Right. with which they can deceive. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Oh, darn it, I forgot the second question. <laughs> Remember the name, but I forget, I'm forgetting the question. It was the... Uh... Galadriel's relationship that we've oh, seen. Oh, to the dwarves. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so second question. Um, Jim, Jim Noneman was asking about, so, you know, we, we've seen, of course, Elrond and Durin and, uh, you know, and their friendship. And we got a little teaser of Narvi and Celebrimbor. Um, but are we going to see, of course, the text makes a big deal of Galadriel's at least her familiarity with the dwarves, and Tolkien kind of built on that in some of his versions of Galadriel's mm -hmm. story, um, that she was more closely connected to or allied with the dwarves. Um, so Jim's question was, do we think we're going to see that story developed? You know, the, there's still time yep, for her yeah, to yeah. Uh, get connected with the dwarves. Yeah, and I think from reading Jim's question, he was also wondering about... Uh, how might that, if that happened, how might that play into her character development? Yes, yes. And how might Celeborn, if he ever appears, the absentee husband... I still have um, faith. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, how might I believe that in play Celeborn. into it? You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, the short answer for me is, I don't think that Galadriel's relationship to the dwarves is going to be important. Now, of mm. course, I don't know. In theory, right. we've got three more seasons to go. I don't know where it's going to go. But at the moment, the versions that I know of her backstory, where the dwarves have a lot of, of uh, input, as it were, are when she and Celeborn are in Eregion with yes. Celebrimbo. And obviously, that ain't going to happen. Right, right. And when it... And furthermore it was when she got to know them was as military allies, mm. when she is acting as a ruler, mm -hmm. right? And makes a, you know, wisely mm -hmm. makes an ally of the mm -hmm. dwarves of Khazad Doom. Yeah. Um, I, I almost said something like to use them. I don't mean that she's right, but in a bad way, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. to avail herself of the military resource yeah. that is the dwarves yeah. of Khazad Doom. Um, so that's the context we're given for it in the Unfinished Tales. Of course, the chapter in Unfinished Tales on Galadriel and Celeborn is a collection of lots of things yeah. that are unclear where exactly, even chronologically, they fall. Um, but in any case, in one of the versions, uh, that's kind of how things happen. I do think... Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I do think I can imagine trying to think how the showrunners might want to move things mm -hmm. forward. Um, you know, if, if Galadriel and Elrond are reconciled, they've had a whole season yeah. of yeah. being at odds and they're reconciled yeah. now. That's cool. And we want to see more Elrond and Durin. Uh, and, and we've had it set up that there's going to be problems for the dwarves. Yeah. That, that, you know, Durin's, Durin's succession to the throne yeah. is not going to be... Well, I can see Galadriel getting involved in that. Right. For sure. Kind of coming along. Third yeah. wheel with Durin in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that it would be lovely, her kindness to Gimli, mm -hmm. uh, when he is sort of so suspicious of the elves and the yes. kindness that she shows, it would be lovely to see at least a bit of her developing a friendship, having an affection. So I don't... I can't imagine us seeing a kind of big picture Galadriel calling yeah. on the dwarves for military help, but I could see 
uh, her getting to know yeah. Durin and developing Kazadu some personal relationships through Elrond, mm -hmm. and perhaps you know another time when she needs to escape in a smaller scale than her leaving Eregion mm -hmm. and going through Khazad-dûm, uh, which obviously isn't going to happen. Right. But there might be a, a, a sort of reflection of that in having Durin maybe help her at mm -hmm. some point to get away from Sauron. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, the reference to Celeborn, right? He doesn't like the dwarves, right? Yes, he doesn't exactly. go with her from Eregion because, largely, it seems right. to be said, because he doesn't like dwarves. And in the Lord of the Rings, that's perfectly clear. The discrepancy in yeah. their attitude towards dwarves is perfectly clear. So that's actually the thing that I was thinking about. So I would say, like, two here are the two opposite sides of that question, right? Yeah. One is. On the one hand, there is no question that there's nothing in Galadriel's trajectory so far that hints that it's coming. Yep. Right. I agree with you. The connection was premised upon her being an Eregion within the books. Mm -hmm. um, given that she's had no whiff of a connection mm -hmm. with Kaz, she, she's never even been tempted to go to Kaz's yep, tomb, yep. right? For a weekend. Right, exactly, right. Um, anyway, so you could say the show has certainly given us nothing to believe that yep. that's coming. And that is per is perfectly true, um, but um, based on the pattern of things that we've seen before, mm -hmm. and what those things seem to suggest to us, okay, about um, the kinds of thing that JD and Patrick enjoy, <laughs> the kinds of stories, okay. the kinds of stories that this show has shown itself interested in, yep. again and again, yeah, right. That moment in the Lord of the Rings, where Galadriel and Celeborn clearly have not had the same dwarf experiences. <laughs> yep. Um, that seems like exactly the kind of moment which s demands a backstory uh -huh. that it's hard for me to imagine them resisting. Resisting the temptation. The temptation to give a backstory to that, especially given... I mean, mm. I, I am not convinced that there is a single word in the Lothlorien chapters of the Fellowship of the Ring mm -hmm. that is not intricately tied somewhere to the storyline that we're seeing. I mean, everything from like the mirror, the, the you know, the telepathy. Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. I mean, everything that we see going on, I think has its, um, I'm not saying that every single one has borne fruit yet. Right, right, right. But I'm but pretty convinced know, that when we get to the end. The mind meld. Yeah, with exactly. Sauron the rebellion against Sauron. The the, right, yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah. Her relationship with Nenya, yeah, the, the yeah, temptation okay. of the ring. All, I mean, it's all there, yeah. right? Or at least we can see how they're laying the foundations for yeah. all of those things, mm -hmm. right? You know, that. Um, and so, therefore. It's hard for me on that level. You think it's hard for me to imagine. And so maybe, maybe they're waiting for Caliborn. Okay. I have a counter to that. Okay. I think that's a very, I think you're right. I actually think you're right. Here's why I think that could be problematic. Okay. Uh, it's going to be really hard to bring Caliborn in. Like it is going to be difficult. I don't know where he's going to pop up from. I don't know how that's going to work. That's the big question. But I assume he needs to be a character that we respond well to, mm -hmm. that we're not like, well, who the hell's this guy? Right. Um, and so it's going to have to be carefully written. So to you're saying like, if they have Kelborn pop up and, and be, be a, a bigot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, this is the thing, right? <laughs> if he's, they're bringing him in, he's been an absentee, it's going to have to be some very skillful writing to bring him in convincingly, reunite him with Galadriel without them being like, well, this is awkward. Do we even like each other anymore? Yeah. You know, I mean, I know elves live a lot longer than us, so they can manage being apart for a lot longer than we perhaps can. But even so, there has got to be some careful engineering there. Yeah. And so for me, if they bring Kettleborn in and then use him to have enmity with the dwarves, he's just going to be a character for us to love to hate. Right. And maybe they're going to choose to do that. You know, we, we, you talking about things that we've seen them do. Yes. They yes. might well and uh, choose to do that. Goodness knows there are lots of people who are not huge Caliborn fans from the books. Right. You know, so. Right. And, and yeah. poor, poor, he didn't, poor Caliborn didn't get a great shake of the tail in Peter Jackson's movies. No, he did not. No. Um, so, yeah, there, there's some history there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I would like to see Kellerborn come in and be a really strong character. Yeah, and, me too. Um, you know, I, I, we all want to know what's going to happen with Elrond meeting his future spouse and how is that going to work? That's the one I see no reason to believe or suspect that that's going to come into that the show. That that's going to happen at all? I, I don't no. understand why it has to. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. It absolutely to. doesn't that's the have thing. to. I mean... People expect it because they're like, but in the book, she's born in the second age. Like, well, yeah, I know. And in the book, the rings of power are made 1500 years before the right, last one. Right. It's like, it doesn't matter. Like that's, yeah. that, I, 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 I can't, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think Calabrian is out there. I don't think, no, I, I just don't. I don't. I don't either. I don't see any need for it. And I see massive hurdles to have to jump over to make it work, to completely. bring her in. I think, um, and rather, I think that uh, motherhood being like, the next frontier for Galadriel after she completes her arc and gets herself in a better place makes perfect sense. Ooh, maybe we'll end at the end of the final season if with it's like season pregnant five, Galadriel. With pregnant Galadriel. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm, 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 I'm kind of half expecting that. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. yeah. So Celeborn's got to come into the picture <laughs> somewhere then in that Absolutely. case. No, I firmly <laughs> believe he's going to come. The two questions are, are they going to be able to make him? I, now, I am ready to give him the, the benefit of the doubt on both. Mm-hmm. Mostly. I give them the benefit of the doubt on bringing in Kelleborn um, and making him a character we don't hate. Mm. I'm not I gonna it's not gonna be promise easy. that. It's not going to be easy and it might not succeed, but I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt to believe that that can happen. Yep. Um, especially after um, the positive reaction I know that I have had to like Kierden and Tom Bombadil and like new characters that mm-hmm, they brought mm-hmm, in this mm-hmm. season. I'm like, okay. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kierden yeah. was awesome. If he's yeah, half as awesome as Kierden, yeah. then that'll be like great. I'd like to have seen more of him. But, My goodness, but, yeah. yes. Yeah, and, it would and, be wonderful yeah. if they could somehow bring in Celeborn for us as the audience to know where he is before Galadriel finds him again right. so that we can have emotional skin in the game on both sides and then imagine if you have great actors yes. you could have an incredible reunion reunion scene, scene. Yes. it could be extremely moving yes. um and and going back to the original question i do think i do think uh i want to see galadriel being friends with dwarves i do mm-hmm. want to see that mm-hmm. i don't think we're going to get a big story about her involvement with dwarves right. Right. but i do think as she as she softens as she you know, moves away from the angry person we met in season one. Yeah. And we've already seen costume wise, her costumes have been softening in yes. season two. Um, then I'd love to see her uh, getting to know more races, mm-hmm. becoming, yeah. heading towards being this wise ruler. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So I think, as I said, I think there are two challenges mm-hmm. that are going to be difficult. Possible, but difficult. The one I feel more confident in their success in is making us like Kelleborn. Mm-hmm. The one I'm more uncertain of is a convincing explanation for where he's been. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's not yeah. that I don't think it's possible, but um, but I still, as I said earlier in the show, I did not find the explanation of why Halbrand got on the boat convincing. Mm. Mm. It just, no matter how I think it through, it doesn't make sense to me. Mm. Um, at least it certainly doesn't make compelling sense. Any sense that it, that I find it makes, I find it undermines something else. Yeah. yeah and so yeah, I have yeah, a problem yeah. with it. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but I can imagine a kind of a more hand wavy explanation, yeah. like, or not yeah, hand wavy. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's not quite fair. But one where basically they essentially say, just roll with this. Yes. And, and, and people will not happen. be willing to roll with it. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they do that sometimes. Well, I think, you know, I, I have an issue with some of the, there are some bigger picture plot things mm-hmm. where when you're dealing with as many strands as they are yeah, and you're dealing with as many seasons as mm-hmm. they are, um, it's going to be hard to keep everything in check and there yes. are some places where i think oh no they've lost the big picture there and that's where you're saying like if if this is true then that doesn't work and that yes. undermines and so i agree to be fair to them 
That happened to Tolkien as well, right? <laughs> yes. Where he would be like, oh, that can't be that character's right. backstory because right. that undermines what I said in this note. So I've yeah. got to go back and retroactively yeah. fix that. Yeah. So when we say that the showrunners are doing that, that's not the worst <laughs> condemnation. No. But it definitely no, is not. happening. And yes, I think to find an entirely satisfactory reason why Caliborn isn't there yeah. is it's going to be challenging. I don't much. think it's impossible. I'm, I'm again. I'm, I'm, I am prepared to be impressed. What do you think about? But, and I'm sidetracking here on yeah. the question, and and you may have already addressed this in another recording. So shut me up if you have. But um, I was reading online people who thought that Adard was going to turn out to be Caliborn, and I was like, because I had that wasn't on my frame of reference at all. No. And then I went back and watched the final episode again and i thought oh okay i can see why for a moment when he turned rejuvenated by nenya why people might have thought oh, he's going to reveal himself to be um w would that have been a neat way of doing it but then he's had no. to have been gone for so blooming long yeah but well exactly no it, it i mean i guess what i'm asking is could Kelleborn have been hiding in plain sight all this time in some way i hope not so to Okay, here's, here's why I say that. Of the two options, option one, he has been taken out of circulation in some kind of... Pit. Absolute <laughs> way. Like, whether he's... Hanging out captive, with Balrog. Right, whether he's, um, you know, on some kind of... Swore an oath and is on some solitary retreat for four millennia. I don't know. But, like, option number one is he's he's been completely yep, 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 yep. inaccessible. The second option is that he's hiding in plain sight somewhere mm. of those two things i think the second one has by far the steeper gradient yeah, 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 yeah. because then you have to convince me why he chose not to yep. reveal himself yep. when he's seeing his wife run all around yeah, and get yeah, into all this yeah. trouble like why did and and not only that but like we know we're told that she like that the incident that we see at the beginning of episode one of season one with the frozen north and stuff, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we are instructed to take that as like representative of her life for centuries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, this. totally, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So he's been gone a long right. time. He's been gone since the first age. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. said he vanished during the yeah, first yeah, age. Yeah. She said so. Um, which if he did that. If he uh, he's if he's been doing that voluntarily, yeah. If he's been hiding in plain sight yeah. and not revealing himself to her, Sucky. he's got <laughs> right. I mean, he's got to have a, like it's got, that reason. He's got to show be up with awesome. more than a bunch of flowers. Oh, way more than a bunch of flowers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Here, I mean, here's a thought. Whilst you were talking, this yeah. came to me. What if? Now I'm, I'm like, hmm. Not saying that this would at all work in Tolkien, but I'm trying to work how it could work out in the in what mm -hmm. we can do in the Rings of Power. What if we find, when we go and find, like Elendil is making his way to the west, to the stronghold of the faithful, what if there is an elf hanging out with them there on the west of Numenor, who for some reason has been there since the men were granted Numenor at the huh. end of the war with Morgoth? I don't know why he would be there, yeah. but the the one trying to think of somewhere he could be where he's away from the mainland. The thing of... that's interesting about that is it combines like it combines the reveal of Celeborn with the reveal of you yeah. know the of Anarion and, 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 yeah, and exactly. everything. The, the right? uh, you know the zone of the faithful. There yeah, in, and I'm like uh, maybe we're gonna because from we've wondered why we've only seen one of Elendil's sons yeah. in the first two seasons. Yeah, we have pretty much been promised at the end of season two that we're gonna meet. Yeah, yeah. the Anarion, other yeah. you know the Anarion's gonna be there in season three. What if Celeborn is also hanging out with him? That's fascinating. Mm. Um, so that would be no. Just I'm postulating that for a second that would feel like some of the later versions of the Galadriel and Caliborn story. Like I'm thinking of the one where he sails east independently, mm. right? Mm. He's just like from Valinor. Yeah. He's not a, you know, a gray elf, but yeah. he's from Valinor and um, he and Galadriel sail yeah. into the east, you know, to, to Middle Earth together. Yeah. Um, it would almost feel like a little bit like that, yeah. right? If he's um, him kind of, 
being in the West and coming back to Middle Earth mm-hmm. from the West. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and also it, the story we were just talking about when they when Galadriel leaves the Region and goes through yeah. Casa Doom, but he's like, no thanks, I don't trust uh, dwarves, and so he stays. He stays for goodness knows how long because yeah. elves live a yeah. long time and so they're quite happy just to be like well i'm doing this so right. see you so you can imagine he might have been like well i want to go and help the men yeah. the faithful who've been granted this gift of this island i want to go and help them yes um but it's one thing to say that they are content during a particular phase of their life which could last centuries mm mm-hmm. They're content during a particular phase of their life to dwell apart Mm -hmm. and to say, I'm going to like fake my own death and and, and then like lie to her. Well, not lie to her, but like she was there in Numenor. That's the thing. And that was pretty famous. And she was there for a while. Like. Would, I mean, maybe he didn't hear about it. Right. Well, there does seem to be a big dis- disconnect between the main city and the folks who are there does. on the western there does. shore. So presumably um, he might not have gotten the news until she left. But 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 just in general, that's the biggest – because I, I, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario. Yeah. Um, if she believes he's dead, which seems to be the case. Yeah, that's if what she If she believes implied. he's dead, yeah. then wouldn't – like, if he's not dead – Surely he can't just be so. Either he's a jerk, and not, you know, he she knows that right, she knows right. he knows that she thinks he's dead and he doesn't tell her, or, or he's completely oblivious. That's what I was gonna say. And is a moron. What if he? Well, yes, but let me on a human scale uh-huh. in the um, the Balkan trilogy that which was made into the TV show Fortunes of War. Okay. Um, so there's a bit in that with the two main characters who were brilliantly played by Kenneth Branner and and um, Emma Thompson in mm-hmm. the in the TV show. But anyway, the, basically, she, they're out in the East uh, during the war in the Balkans. That's what's the Balkan trilogy. Yeah. And she decides she wants to go home um, to Britain. So she goes to, their, their marriage isn't going well. She leaves. At the dock to get on the boat, she meets a friend and says, I don't actually want to go. And the friend says, come with us then. Boat goes off, the boat is torpedoed, no survivors. He gets the news that the boat is torpedoed for. He knows she was on the boat. Right. He assumes she's dead. Right. Um, she doesn't know that the boat's been torpedoed. So she thinks he, he their marriage wasn't great anyway. He was annoyed. She was annoyed. She thinks that he thinks she's at home quite happily and that they'll get in touch again at some point. He thinks she's dead. She goes off having a jolly with her friends. Eventually, like... Months later, she finds out that that boat was torpedoed and she says, oh, Guy is his name. She says, Guy must think I'm dead. And so she makes her way back just to huh. say to him, I'm not dead. And, and you know, so it is possible to conceive of a situation where one character... They were having some time apart. Has got, or he was like, okay, I'm just going to go and help these people. And yeah. the ship that he was going on went right. down. Or So like, and, he went to the battle... And like his battalion was all slaughtered, the battalion he was in or whatever was yeah, all slaughtered. Yeah, yeah. And so she's concluded that he's dead. Yeah. And he maybe, you know, you could think he thinks maybe that she knows right. that he's not dead and that he'd said, I'm going to go and help these guys. But she doesn't, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I'm really starting to twist things here, but they're going to have to. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's challenging. It's yeah. really hard. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the elements of the stories where I'm like, I can't think of a really good Mm. way out of that problem. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't think there is one, Mm -hmm. but I can't think of one. And I like thinking Mm -hmm. of (laughs) ways out of problems like this. West Coast of Numenor, that's my best shot. West Coast of Numenor. (laughs) Well, that's interesting. I had not considered that. It would be interesting to see an active elf presence in Numenor. With the faithful. With the faithful. Even a new one. That is to say, even like now that the persecution has broken out for the elves to... The elves, of, you know, in Tolaresia yeah, to hear yeah, about this yeah, and yeah, send yeah, somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. would be cool. Like that'd be that'd be maybe that'd be... that's where we'll meet him. Oh, <laughs> Gorfindel. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Maybe that's how we meet Gorfindel. Oh, that would be nice. Maybe Gorfindel comes back 
d- uh, uh, ooh, I like that oh, idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm liking yeah, that. Done solve the Kelborn problem, but that could be good. Right, Finn would right. be a great candidate. Elf come from the West. All right, so so okay. only a small fee for these ideas. Yeah, that's it. Should that's they it. choose to yeah. use them? Okay, that's right. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Did we answer the question in that? I think we did. Sort of. Or at least we we confess we don't know the answer (laughs) to the question. No, the dwarf question we did. Yes, maybe she'll have Um, friends, but not major relationships. Okay, so one last thing about, um, I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. Let's assume Kelborn comes back and we don't all have a fit about it. Kelborn is back. I can imagine a a circumstance Mm -hmm. in which... uh, it isn't that he's just turns out to be an anti-dwarf bigot from day one, mm-hmm. but that something happens. Oh, sure. Which she is okay with, but he is not okay with. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And he retains mm-hmm. the memory of the thing he is not okay mm-hmm. with, but she forgives or mm-hmm. she, you know, so he doesn't, again, he doesn't have to be just simply a jerk yep. uh, yeah, yeah. in order for, there to be like uh, an inequity well, in their experience and memory. Let's run about with the for a moment the idea if he's in Numenor, if yeah. he were. Okay. Yeah. He's going to see extreme anti elf. For sure. Behavior attitudes sure. there. Yes. And anyone who has seen other races being strongly against their race. Yeah can become more insular, more uh, distrustful of other races, and therefore that could play into it. It could be partly that he is already on a back foot because he's seen how, okay, not dwarves, they're men, but he's seen how the Numenorians can epically turn on elf kind. Yes. And so that maybe means that he is already ready to take offense and to be right. mistrustful right. of other races. Yeah, and another thing, remember the thing that elicits Celeborn's harshest language about dwarves in the book mm. is the reference to Durin's bane, the yeah. Balrog. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's what gets him. Yeah. Right. If I had known that the dwarves had stirred up this evil again, I would not have allowed you to. That's mm-hmm. when he mm-hmm. starts going all thingle on, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, on Gimli yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. It could be the incident, the scarring incident. Could be the, involving our Balrog Involving the friend. Balrog, yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah. him blaming the dwarves. Yeah. Not because the dwarves were bad, you know, like Durin is bad to him. Yeah. But because he blames the dwarves yeah. Yeah, for yeah. Hmm. the Balrog. So if the Balrog would, yeah. Yeah. Well, and we know there is a Balrog sneaking around somewhere in, exactly. that, in the Second exactly. Age here. So. Yeah. yeah well, no, it is. I... For me, I put that at the top of my list of like um, stuff I am biggest, just as for season two, the biggest thing at the top of my list of this is a question I want to see answered mm-hmm. is why did Halbrand get on the boat? Mm-hmm. For season two, my big question is. Where is Kelborn been and what does he think he's doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And again, again, the question is not because I don't think it could be answered. Yeah. But it's going to be challenging be to have a good thing. answer. Yeah. All so right, we'll see. Good. All right. Very good. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us. See you guys next time.